Atlanta Life Insurance Company proudly celebrates Black History Month. Hello, my name is Roosevelt Giles, Chairman of Atlanta Life Insurance Company. We are proud of our history at Atlanta Life. We were founded by Alonzo Herndon, a freed slave and former sharecropper, in 1905 amidst the Atlanta race riots. Today we have our own riots we are dealing with while trying to navigate the physical and emotional toll of a global pandemic. Now more than ever, people need the safety and security net provided by insurance. 70 million people of color are underinsured or have no insurance. We are here to support them and help everyone build wealth and legacy. But our policies are just one way we're helping. Atlanta Life is investing in game-changing initiatives like the Herndon Directors Institute and entrepreneur program for our inner city youth in order to build a bridge to full economic voting rights. Alonzo Herndon created a company from the ashes of Atlanta. We should ask ourselves, what could we build as a country if we the people were united, united for social and economic security for all? We the people has always been broken for people of color. Now it is broken for everyone, which is what makes this such an important topic. Atlanta Life is proud to support this program because this is a conversation we can't afford to ignore. Twenty, a year like no other. The pandemic, deadly police shootings, and protests have people all across the country and here in the metro fighting for changes in their community. And as we celebrate Black History Month, we're taking a closer look at what's being done to shape our future and our culture. Hello and welcome. I'm Francesca Amaker. 34 years ago, a young black man came up during the time of mass incarceration and the crack epidemic. He knew he could be profiled, harassed, and even killed just walking down the street. And those were just some of his reasons to become a sheriff's deputy. He's sharing with our Hope Forward his experience in law enforcement, how it's changed, and where he hopes it's going. Take a good look at this picture. We're going to come back to it. Police culture is under a microscope. Protesters calling for change, just opposed with an officer commended for saving lives during the Capitol riot. Not just any officer, a black man. Now, remember this picture? It's at a protest in Atlanta. This man is a retired sheriff's deputy, and this is a visual representation of how black members of law enforcement navigate two worlds, the black and the blue. I had some hesitation. I said, you know, I could be shot and killed. But I also thought as a black man at that point in the time, just walking down the street, I could be shot and killed. I made a mature decision to get into law enforcement, understanding that I was a black man first, but I'm an officer second. Charles Rambo worked for the Fulton County Sheriff's Office for 27 years, influenced by other black officers like Officer Claude Mundy, the first black Atlanta officer to be killed in the line of duty in 1961. He was one of the first black police officers that joined the force. When he patrolled in the old fourth ward, he got the attention of the community that they knew he was there for business, but he loved his community. Rambo wanted to take the same approach, firm yet loving and respectful of the community. He started during a time when two tough on crime policies were mainstream. I started off basically during the era of mass incarceration. I also came up during the crack epidemic. So I saw within inside of the Fulton County Jail the statistics that rang true, unfortunately, of the majority of inmates that we have were black males. Black officers tread a world where both racial slurs and calls of backstabbing are common. Having to be called uh, Uncle Tom and all other type of unnice type names, that can take a toll on a person who does that 40 hours a week, only gets one day off if he doesn't get called back in. And people think that, you know, we don't have a legitimate concern about our communities. We do. But Rambo's never felt torn. He knows people call out the symbol of the badge, not always him as a person. Rambo's witnessed the divide between communities and police departments, a divide that's grown deeper from the soils of Rodney King to George Floyd. We have to go back and look at the intersection of race and law enforcement from a historical perspective, because there's real hurt inside of communities, particular black communities. You get generational mindsets. They will pass on the stories that will make either the cousins, the 
nephews, make them angry about the history that they've had to go through dealing with law enforcement. In 2017, 27% of white officers believed deaths of black people during encounters with police are signs of a broader problem. Among black officers, that number grows to 57%. You cannot police the same way that was policed in the 40s and the 50s in any particular community. You also have to look at in terms of the mindset. What is the mindset of that particular black officer or white officer when they come across a situation? Are you really there trying to bring justice or are you there trying to agitate a situation? Although retired, Rambo found himself patrolling Metro Atlanta in a different way, sharing his perspective with protesters. Remember this picture? He teaches new recruits how to interact with the public and how to avoid racial profiling while training kids with his Know Your Rights program. He says he knows change is needed and believes it will take the law enforcement community and the public to make that happen. And wherever there's a challenge, there's an opportunity. And that's what we need to paint more or less as a brighter future that will take us away from where we came from law enforcement, from the days of slavery, through the days of segregation, through the days of civil rights, through the days of George Floyd. We've got to change this. I have a child of my own and I want to make sure that I'm training and that I'm giving her the right emotional intelligence and putting her in position for the right opportunities. I cannot do a disservice to Officer Mundy or others who came before me and not carry on with trying to uh, make improvements to leave the profession better than what I found. I spread my message to a lot of black officers today, white officers, it doesn't make a difference. We have a total responsibility to make sure that our profession is more legitimized in the 21st century. Sports and social justice have connected throughout history, and Atlanta Hawks head coach Lloyd Pierce takes that to heart. Pierce was out in front when NBA players took to the streets of Atlanta to protest racial injustice last summer. Alex Glaze looks back with Pierce on all that he's helped to accomplish following a very emotional year. That speech would blow this world up away right now because it still rings true. We're still waiting. Black history is everyone's history and it continues to be written by all of us. I think 2020 is, is kind of a historic year, um, mainly for all the wrong reasons. What was your experience like as a black man in 2020? Sadden, you, you, you're just sad all the time for me. I'm just saddened as a black man because I can experience every single time there's an injustice done to someone of color, of any color. Uh, you can feel it aching at your own heart. The Atlanta Hawks with the NBA proudly celebrate black history. For the Hawks, their efforts don't just last in February, but throughout the year in the city of Dr. Martin Luther King. And for the Hawks, head coach Lloyd Pierce, how he tries to honor Dr. King it's by his actions. The privilege comes with the position, but it doesn't come with the person. I, I wasn't born in the privilege. The position has privilege, but the position is temporary. At a time when sports went dark and the streets were empty, the world was evaluating its priorities. On May 25th, the death of George Floyd sparked an awakening. Neither can breathe. Justice! No! Athletes spoke out like never before. It's not just going to take just me it's not just going to take just you it's all of us coming together you've seen all our guys or most of the guys that i mean i've taken part of people that have been out there vocally and just uh continue to push the right message forward joining and leading the march was pierce I think any any great movement in the history of this country has always been led by a younger generation of people uh you think of dr martin luther king and, and the civil rights leaders they were all young they, they were tremendously young when they started their fight. And so I, I don't I don't think there's a separation for our players or any players, uh, mainly because of the access, the reach and the resources that they currently have. Uh, they have an ability to impact change. We would all like to believe that when the time comes and, you know, there's almost like a calling for us to either, you know, step up or not to make that decision. You chose to step up. Can you even look back now and look and realize what that meant personally to you to, to be in that role? Yeah, you know, I think sometimes it's it's hard 
For me, I, I became a head coach in, in the city of Atlanta, and we know what the city of Atlanta represents. And so you, you, you kind of understand that there's a moral responsibility that comes with that, a civic responsibility that comes with that. You never realize you're going to find your purpose. And for me, I think I found my purpose wasn't to be a head coach. That's my job. Uh, that's my passion. My purpose was to to help a nation of people. That passion led to the NBA putting Pierce in charge of a league-wide coalition to improve the fight for social justice. It helped the league create a unified voice and the transformation of stadiums into polling precincts. Like I've, I've done a, a very minor thing. I was able to speak it into existence, but it wasn't my idea. I was just a guy that had a microphone. For the NBA, we have 30 cities that we can impact change in, and, and that's what we're committed to doing. The Hawks are back on the floor, and this year, just like every year, they play to honor the civil rights heroes that came before them, having continued their work on and off the court. It's how do you remain hopeful that things can change? I've never tried to convince another person racism existing. My, my whole objective is how do I help uh, provide opportunities for others? How do I prevent situations for, uh, from occurring for those that are less fortunate? Because if, if we can provide hope to people, uh, maybe they can provide opportunities for themselves. Pierce has always outspoken on the issues that affect the black community, but his mantra is he doesn't want to just talk about the issues, but take action and create change. It's clear he's well on his way to doing that. As far as a black city, we have the greatest potential to get it right. It's been 50 years since Atlanta was first called the Black Mecca, but parallel to black excellence runs the road of income inequality. Why Atlanta is not Wakanda, next. Atlanta Life Insurance Company presents Black History Month and Institute of Hope. 116 years ago, Alonzo F. Herndon, a former slave, founded Atlanta Life on the principles of stakeholder capitalism, social responsibility, and equity. Today, Atlanta Life embodies those principles with a focus on diversity, equity, and inclusion. Atlanta Life works tirelessly to provide financial security to underserved communities and at-risk citizens. This month, Atlanta Life and the Alonzo F. and Norris B. Herndon Foundation unveiled its newest initiative, the Herndon Directors Institute, created to address the lack of economic voting rights in the boardroom. The premise is simple. Give the country's best and brightest female black and brown professionals a seat at the table in some of the biggest corporate boardrooms in America. Led by Dr. Janetta Cole, the Herndon Directors Institute is committed to making sure the next generation is better prepared to succeed at the highest levels of leadership. Learn more at the Herndon Directors Institute.org. I always tell people that uh, diversity is not just uh, a nice thing to do in the corporate board world, it's imperative. You get better corporate results and diverse thinking comes about with people with diverse experiences, and people with diverse backgrounds. We're going to have to come up with new business models, new business approaches, new procedures, and that calls out for the need for increased diversity. So that's what I appreciate what the Herndon Institution is doing, and that is to develop a program to get aspiring minority board members ready to be on boards and to be more effective once they get on boards. They're underwriting the whole thing, so it's at no cost to the participants. And second, they're letting the participants sit in in their board meetings to actually get experience in the boardroom with the hope that within a couple of years, these people can directly be put on board. So it's not just an educational program. It's not just a networking weekend. It's real hands-on with mentorship. I'm involved with several of these programs that are emerging. Uh, I've got to say, hey, this, is, this one's incredible. Welcome back. As we continue to shape our future, the fight for social justice and systemic racial inequalities also continue right here in our own community. Naima Abdullahi gives us a look at the racial wealth gap in Atlanta and those working to bridge that gap. Atlanta is not Wakanda. It's not. I know you want to believe it. We've all heard it, but it's not. Let me just break it down for you. It is arguably the culture capital of the entire nation. The number one destination for film, entertainment, music, hip hop in the Southeast, known for black history, black excellence, known as the black Mecca, with so many incredible come up stories like Tyler Perry, 
Who wouldn't be inspired by that? But while you fighting for a seat at the table, I'll be down in Atlanta building my own. While it is the heartbeat of the culture, unfortunately, at the same time, it's ranked as the number one destination for income inequality. There's the romanticized version of Atlanta, and then there's the real Atlanta. Both a reality, but both, when combined, tell the story of this city, the number one city for the haves and the have-nots. I would never call Atlanta Wakanda. We do have a special city here. Let me be clear on that. But we can't negate those that struggle the most in this city. While the census says black people are the majority of the population in Atlanta, the wealth gap between black Atlantans and white Atlantans is dramatic. The median household income for a white family is about 83,000 compared to 28,000 for a black family, according to the Atlanta Wealth Building Initiative. If a person is born into poverty in Atlanta, there's just a 4% chance of escaping poverty in their lifetime. To compare the economic racial divide, just 2% of white households in Atlanta live below the poverty line compared to 29% of black households. The average black owned business is valued at about 58,000, while the average value of a white business is more than 600,000. But the imbalance doesn't stop there. Atlanta's top 5% of earners are bringing home around $300,000 a year, while the bottom 20% all live below the poverty line, making less than $17,000 a year. So who's in that bottom 20%? You'll find most of them in the heart of Atlanta's South Side and West Side, where historic black communities are trying to hold on to their neighborhoods as property value goes up, and gentrification brings in new neighbors. I was thinking that we would be here forever. It looks like it's getting close. You're being robbed without a gun. In the west side, 53% of the homes are vacant and almost half the people living there live below the poverty line. Uh, Atlanta's the worst city in the country when it comes to income inequality. It's the worst city in the country when it comes to economic mobility. Because the harsh reality is in the city of Atlanta, there are no poor majority white neighborhoods. There are no failing Latino schools in the APS school system. There are no Asian ghettos in the city of Atlanta. Almost 100% of those deplorable statistics are black people in a black city. Yes, Atlanta continues to hold on to its title as the Black Mecca. The first time that association surfaced was in 1971 in Ebony Magazine. The idea of, you know, quote unquote, black excellence doesn't trickle to, to, to all the black folk. And the real culprit is American greed. Atlanta, the city too busy to hate, a phrase that was coined during segregation, has highways that show the city's struggle. Historians say the highways intentionally went through black neighborhoods that were going to get bulldozed and also created a border between white and black neighborhoods, for example, the North and South Atlanta. The thing about it is that was done by design. If you go into federal records, you can see how the deliberation took place to in, in, in where we should put the interstate. The city by and large is segregated. That segregation along socioeconomic lines is still visible to this day. I'm a firm believer that the only difference between Bankhead and Buckhead is access, opportunity, and exposure. We were here before Mercedes-Benz came along. The two versions of Atlanta both tell the story of this city. One doesn't get told as often as the other. Yes, let's go on record to say that as far as a black city, we have the greatest potential to get it right. We have wholeheartedly adopted the reputation of being the black method. So we know that there is a appetite to, to have that be a reality. If Atlanta wants to continue living up to its title as the Black Mecca, well, then Black Atlanta needs to be part of the economic engine that helped establish this city as the premier destination for Black excellence. It was a call to action and two women answered. Next, their plan to address systemic racism in Atlanta's Black community. Atlanta Life Insurance Company presents Black History Month, Walking the Walk.
When Alonzo and Norris Herndon built Atlanta Life, the mission was to help the community become healthier, wealthier, and financially secure. Atlanta Life Insurance is majority owned by the Herndon Foundation, which makes Atlanta Life the only insurance company in the country owned by the community. When customers buy their insurance from Atlanta Life, the earnings flow back, supporting important issues like social justice, economic equality, criminal justice reform, and inclusion through investments in key foundations, charities, and HBCUs. Atlanta Life donated more than $100,000 in December 2020 to 1,100 parents to buy food and their children Christmas presents. At Atlanta Life, the focus isn't on profits, but on how those profits are used to benefit our city and our community. And that's stakeholder capitalism at its core. Walking the walk. Learn more on AtlantaLife.com. As Roosevelt Giles, the chairman of Atlanta Life, has said so many times, capitalism helped create this problem. Capitalism needs to solve this problem. And I think business is really an engine that can drive fundamental change. This is a moment where a lot of people are knowing something is inherently wrong. This has to change. So we're overcoming something from the past, but we've got to be more intentional about this. We need to go beyond the charitable model to the empowerment model. The empowerment model says you have the gifting and the intelligence to be at the table. You need to be here because we're going to be better for that. But this is not a handout. This is really going to strengthen capitalism in America. This is going to do so much for everybody. What we want to do is just enable groups like Atlanta Life to just be at the table. Once they're at the table, they can compete with the best. They've got the best. for racial equality over the summer now has many companies taking a stand on social issues. After months of research, the Metro Atlanta Chamber is taking action to create racial equity in the city. Natisha Lance takes a look at its new initiative. I can't breathe! But what we really saw in June was the social justice voice really raise um, loudly. And the business community, uh, when I came into this role, said, Katie, what can we do collectively to make an impact. In the wake of summer 2020 protest and the violent arrest and death of George Floyd, okay, demonstrators received support from an unexpected place, corporate America. Iconic brands like Nike stood up against racism by aligning with the cause of Black Lives Matter. Streaming company Netflix set off a chain reaction of various company tweets supporting the movement. At the time, it was easy to say something, but many wondered when companies would take substantial action. We are in this moment trying to embody the urgency of now. We think that Atlanta, and in particular our business community, can be a wonderful example of how to really accelerate change. Katie Kirkpatrick and Deisha Barnett are taking the first step to answer the call for action. Through the Metro Atlanta Chamber, the women helped launch the ATL Action for Racial Equity. It's a multi-year, multi-step action plan designed to address the ongoing effects of systemic racism impacting Metro Atlanta's black community. This is an opportunity for the business community to lean in collectively together. For years, Atlanta has been seen as a black mecca, ranking first with the greatest population share of black residents. The city ranks number two among large metros for blacks working in management positions and number three for black owned employer firms. But even a Mecca has flaws. Atlanta actually, in many categories, lead. But it's not strong enough when you look at the equity issues and the equity numbers, especially economic mobility within our black community. A Brookings Institute study found Atlanta is the worst place for inequity in the country. If you're born poor in Atlanta, you only stand about a 4% chance of moving up the economic rung. About 30% of black adults in the metro area have a bachelor's, graduate, or professional degree, compared to 44% of whites. And the medium household income of black people is 67% of white people. The Metro Atlanta Chamber is tackling the issue with help from more than 150 businesses that have signed on to the initiative. It's just great business. It's one of those things that it really will help to build a stronger and thriving community and world, ultimately. Six days after Floyd's death, Hawk CEO Steve Coonan tweeted, Silence is cowardly. Start loving each other. Start listening to each other. 
The Hawks and the other committed companies will work to make improvements in four areas, corporate policies, inclusive economic development, education, and workforce development. So this isn't intended to be a one and done. It's not intended to be a pledge. This is a commitment to action. And the only way for us to continue to make progress is to measure how well we are doing. The chamber created a playbook for each category, including best practices, resources, and peer-to-peer -peer opportunities. Each company will have an annual assessment to track their progress. So it is an economic and moral imperative for us to lift and to really push forward in this initiative. Vanishing Black Atlanta, the untold stories of the city's rich black history. We're taking a closer look at the push to preserve the city's past and present. Atlanta Life Insurance Company presents Black History Month, The Game Changers. When Norris Herndon built Atlanta Life into the largest black-owned insurance company in America, he never wavered from the foundation his father, Alonzo Herndon, set for his company and his family. Be inclusive. Give back. Today, Atlanta Life, through the Herndon Foundation, runs a program called Game Changers to celebrate and lift up inner-city at-risk youths in underserved communities. The program inspires young people to use education as a springboard to an entrepreneurial mindset and to plan for a successful future. The results have been extraordinary. Being able to uh, see yourself be recognized for things that you're talented or gifted at um, without having to say, hey, notice me, um, but they notice you and they actually put you in positions to be able to boost off of that leadership. I think that's pretty cool. Learn more about the Herndon Foundation Game Changers program on AtlantaLife.com. I'm Peter Georgescu. I'm an optimist in the possibility that uh, America could see its best days ahead of us. We think of inequality only in terms of income or wealth inequality. Those are outcomes of some other problems. What we really should aspire to have is equality of opportunity. That to me is the entire notion of the American dream. Why am I optimistic? It is called stakeholder capitalism, which means that there are multiple stakeholders. You start with the customer and the workers and, if you will, the shareholders and the suppliers to the corporation itself. You have to worry about all of those people. Atlanta Life is a player in this effort and a player in trying to support the interests of minorities. Diversity produces better results. when. Business treats their people well, they'll win. As the city of Atlanta celebrates Black History Month and the civil rights leaders who called Atlanta home, there is a year-round effort to make sure the city's black history is remembered every day of the year. Naima Abdullahi has the story. At the intersection of the past and present are pieces of nostalgia that could fade away if not preserved. Dr. Skip Mason calls it vanishing black Atlanta, and he's made it his mission to save that history by any means. I started my vanishing black Atlanta Facebook group back in 2012, just out of sheer boredom. And then the Facebook group grew now to 40,000 members, all sharing pieces of history from childhood memories, old buildings and black voices that helped shape this city. Dr. Skip Mason, who is also a reverend and a community leader, has become a distinguished archivist that facilitates important conversations about Atlanta history on and offline. Atlanta has not fared well in preserving its historical sites. We have torn down churches to build stadiums. If we don't talk about it, if we don't memorialize it, then it remains vanished. One of his initiatives is to inspire historic markers throughout the city to show what vanished and what can be remembered. This is his message to city leaders who can make that happen. Be intentional uh, and direct in ensuring that the African-American historic sites have a voice, what started as a space for just photos is now a discussion forum for issues that impact black communities throughout the metro. When we talk about gentrification and we talk about homes 
uh, being lost by taxes or foreclosed or elderly people not being able to take very good care uh, of that. Uh, it creates an emotion. And long after February ends, Dr. Mason says the work continues to show the power and resilience of black history in this city. But in Atlanta, it's 365 days, 24-7 that our history is important. We want to thank you so much for joining us. We hope you've enjoyed our Black History Month special. Atlanta Life Insurance Company proudly celebrates Black History Month.